is going to be recorded. Um, and then uh, we will also share the link once the webinar is done so that uh, we can uh, you can take a look at it after afterwards. Um, I will be your presenter. I am Aravind Seshadri. Uh, I'm with Roll to Roll Technologies. Just to give you a background, I have been with Roll to Roll for almost six years now. And before that, I was at uh, Oklahoma State University. Uh, I got my PhD in uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering, uh, specializing in uh, dynamics and control of roll-to-roll -roll machines. So topics such as web guiding, um, tension control, registration, or some of the things that are I'm familiar with. Um, as we go along in this presentation, we'll also have some polls or some questions so that we get to know a little bit more about you and what are some of the problems and hopefully we can uh, take advantage of that and um, uh, guide the presentation along the way. <clears throat> Once again, we're about ready to start the webinar. Um, and uh, as part of that, uh, let me just uh, give you a, a quick poll. Uh, if you can answer that really quick in the next minute or so, uh, that will help me in terms of uh, some of the topics that will be covered today. Uh, and we can look at um, um, how we can uh, tailor that to the audience. <clears throat> so basically, we just wanted to know a little bit more about your knowledge about uh, web guiding. Um, there are some people who might have no knowledge about web guiding. There are some who might just know what a web guide is, how it works, or some of them are well versed in being a designer. They can design web guides uh, or design web guides into their machines, or uh, some of them could be even experts that are called upon whenever you have any issues with web guiding in your operation. So I'll give a, just a quick uh, a minute. Uh, or 30 seconds to make sure that everybody had a chance to um, answer this question. Okay, seems like uh, we have a pretty good mix of audience here. People ranging from uh, uh, people with no knowledge about web guiding and uh, also some experts uh, in web guiding. Okay, um, thank you for taking that poll. Uh, that gives me a pretty good idea on how we can proceed uh, with the presentation. Okay, so before we start web guiding, let's just uh, look at some of the common terminologies or um, names that are used for uh, web guiding. Uh, web guiding is also referred to as steering. Some people call as tracking. Uh, depending upon whether we are guiding the edge of the web or a feature on the web, it might be called as edge guiding, line guiding, contrast guiding. Uh, more technical term would be like lateral control or lateral registration. These are some common terms that uh, are used in the academia uh, when we are talking about guiding. Uh, sometimes it's also called as CD registration. CD where CD stands for cross machine direction um, registration and then lateral alignment. And if you are um, from uh, eastern part of the world uh, in Asia, uh, it's uh, commonly referred to as EPC or edge position control or line position control. Essentially, all of this means the same thing. That is, uh, guiding or a web guide uh, is used to position the um, web at the desired cross machine direction. And it is uh, done so that we can enable efficient transport. If the web is not guided, then we have issues uh, with the web crashing into the machine, quality issues, waste, and things like that. So why do we need web guiding? Well, there are main, only, mainly four uh, reasons why we need web guiding. Uh, 
first and foremost is that materials are not perfect. Uh, you might have a poorly wound roll uh, that uh, is not wound properly or deliberately wound roll uh, with an oscillation on it. And when you are trying to feed it into your roll to roll machine, um, you, you need to guide it so that it aligns with your process. Uh, some materials may have a thickness variation uh, this could be like gauge band variation, either during coding or uh, forming processes, uh, especially with uh, paper mills. Um, uh, different gauge papers uh, may track differently or um, slide differently. Uh, splices, whenever you have a change from one roll to another, when you are joining two rolls of web, uh, it might be a step change or it might also be like an angular misalignment of the splice. And then some materials have a natural curvature to them, which is called as camber. So the material properties, when the materials are not perfect, that's going to have uh, the web mi mistrack in your machine. Uh, it could also be due to uh, machine itself. So either you have machines with out of round rollers, um, like a crown or a concave or a convex roller, whenever you have a variation in the diameter of the roller, uh, that's a problem. Or the rollers are not aligned properly with respect to each other. That could also cause uh, the webs to mistrack. You might also have uh, tension control issues. Uh, if you don't have enough tension, you don't have traction, then uh, that's going to be an issue. And uh, whenever you have acceleration or deceleration, that might also cause uh, the web to mistrack. It could also be due to processes. Uh, for example, if you have a coding process and you have uneven coding uh, across the width of the web, uh, that's going to cause issues with tracking. And also some processes where uh, you could have um, air entrained between the web and the roller uh, that would cause the web to uh, lose traction and mistrack. So that could also be an issue, and uh, that's why we, we need web guiding. Finally, operators, uh, mainly when they are splicing the web or when they are putting a new parent role into their roll-to-roll -roll machine, they may not center it or they may not put it at the right location. That might also cause an issue, uh, and that might need web guiding. So web guides are necessary uh, at uh, different locations of the machine um, because you might need alignment at different parts of the machine. Um, so um, that's that's the main uh, thing with web guiding is you have to put a web guide in front of any process that requires web alignment. Just to give you an example, uh, let's say you are laminating something and um, <clears throat> you have two um, layers of web coming in to this lamination process. Uh, at this point, you would need a web guide so that you can align this layer and this layer with respect to each other. Um, the guides that are used within the machine are called as intermediate guides, or they are intermediate to the machine. And the guides that are used at the entry and exit of the machines are called as terminal guides. So we're going to look at all of these in detail. Um, but that gives you an idea of why we need web guides and where we need web guides. Uh, in terms of the location, uh, as I mentioned, um, when you have a web guide that um, um, uh, that is located at the entry and exit of the machine, they are called as terminal web guides. Uh, there are lots of names for these, and uh, some of the common names are uh, shifting stand, a shifting base, a shifting side lay, or roll positioning stands. If you're in the metals industry, it might be uncoil or recoil. And uh, in other industries, it might be called payoff and tension reel. And specifically in these presentations and in our terminologies, we call them as unwind and rewind guide. Uh, an unwind guide is something that is at the uh, entry of your roll to roll machine, uh, while a rewind guide is at the winder or the exit of a roll to roll machine. Uh, so these are some of the terms that are used for terminal guides. And in terms of intermediate guides, uh, these are the web guides that are used within the process, within the machine. Uh, there are certainly multiple types of these web guides. 
And um, the most common one is uh, what is called as an offset pivot guide. Other names for offset pivot guides are displacement guides, positive displacement guide, pivot frame, or a table guide. Um, the second most commonly used uh, intermediate web guide is a remotely pivoted guide. Uh, that's a technical norm, uh, term, uh, but most commonly it's called as a um, steering guide or a steering roller or a swivel roller. Um, and then there are other less common web guides like end pivoted guide or center pivoted guide and then even turn bars are all available. We'll, we'll take a little bit deeper look at all of these different kinds uh, as we go along in this presentation. But um, most of these web guides work on a basic fundamental principle. And that is what we call it as normal entry. So um, what does normal entry say? Normal entry is basically uh, is a web approaching a roller will always align itself perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the roller. As you see in this uh, video right here, let me restart that. Uh, as soon as the, the roller on the left has a misalignment, the web started to track and it started to move in such a way that it will approach the roller on the left perpendicular to the axis of the rotation. This is the fundamental principle that is used in most of the intermediate web guides that we are going to see. And um, what's happening here is that the web is essentially behaving like a beam and the angular displacement on this left hand side is bending the beam and it's causing the beam to bend and that's what is causing the web to track to this side. Um, there are lots of dynamics involved in this uh, process, how fast the web uh, moves, how much does it move? All of those depends upon the uh, transport conditions, the uh, what type of web it is, what kind of traction you have, and things like that. And obviously, the static behavior is that um, at steady state, once this angle is set, how much is it going to move? Uh, are we going to see uh, any movement on this side? Um, as you can notice that when this web moved the upstream roller, the web was still there. Uh, it was maintaining there because it was able to have enough traction so that the lateral forces or the moment that is acting there uh, was not able to make the web move. Um, and whenever we have a, a motion like this, um, bending occurs. Bending in term means that there are stresses developed in the web. So you're going to have a, a tight side and a slack side, and there's going to be a tension profile here. So these are important uh, to understand uh, for us in order to have a successful um, web guiding application or execution of a web guide. Um, so in terms of a basic web guiding system, um, we are mainly dealing with uh, four main items. Apart from the web, we're mainly dealing with four main items. Uh, one is the guide structure or the mechanism. Uh, this is the device that is actually making contact with the web. And uh, that's the one that is need to be moved or it moves the web. Um, and there are different types of guide structures that we will go through. Uh, the other component of a web guiding system is an actuator. So actuator is something that takes uh, an electrical signal and then um, it uh, converts that into physical motion uh, so that it moves the guide structure so that the web can be located at uh, the desired location. Uh, the third and one of the most important components of a web guiding system is a sensor. Uh, the sensor is the device that provides the feedback. Uh, the sensor is the one that tells us uh, where the web is. Uh, uh, where means it's inferring the position. And then finally, that signal is sent to a controller. And the controller is ma uh, mainly the intelligence or the brains um, that, um, uh, that uh, takes that sensor signal and computes the corrective action that is required so that the actuator can move the guide mechanism to the, the location where we can uh, get the desired web position. Uh, 
again uh, another schematic of how um, the components of the web guides are so web is a part of the web guiding system um, and then you have the mechanism there's an actuator inside the mechanism uh, the sensor gets the position feedback of where the web is sends that information to the controller controller then computes an error and it sends the command to the actuator so that the mechanism can be moved to position the web at the right location so this is a closed loop feedback control system that uh, is a main part of a web guiding system so uh, let's dive into detail about different components of the web guide uh, first we'll start off with guide structures and look at how guide structures are with uh, different types of web guides that we saw so first and foremost we have the unwind uh, web guide structure in this case you have a parent role and that is feeding the web into your machine and this role um, is on a shifting stand or a base um, that is supported by typically uh, linear bearings um, and then there's an actuator there that connects the moving stand with the fixed base and then there's a sensor here that is looking at the uh, position of the web so the main objective of an unwind web guide is to ensure that the web that is fed into the process is at the desired location and because of that you have a fixed um, sensor that is fixed to a machine frame and then this stand actually moves in and out of the monitor um, that we have here it's going to go in and out and um, uh, the uh, the feedback from the sensor is used to make this unwind guide move in and out so that it can position at the right location one thing I wanted to point out is that the, there is a, a shifting idler. When I say shifting idler, it means that this idler is attached to this moving base. Uh, the main reason why we do that is that if we put a sensor right here, um, it is not an ideal location um, just because of the fact that when the diameter of this roller changes, you're going to have the web plane go in and out. And if that happens, that's going to affect your guiding. So typically, you would see a shifting idler. It doesn't have to be one. It can be multiple. Uh, it could also be a whole frame with a lot of rollers here. All that we need to do is that we need to put the sensor just downstream of the last shifting idler. And then the sensor is fixed to the machine frame so that we can guide the web. So those are the main things with an unwind uh, guide. Now, uh, when we look at rewind guide, rewind, um, even though we call it as a guiding, it's not actually guiding the web, it's actually chasing the web. Um, so the, the, the main thing that is uh, unique about this is that in a rewind system, you have a sensor that is attached to the rewind frame. Um, all of the things in, in terms of the carriage, it's exactly the same. Uh, you have a sensor that is attached to the rewind uh, stand so that when the rewind moves, the sensor also moves. And then you have a fixed idler right after this, uh, this moving sensor. Uh, like I mentioned, rewind is not really guiding the web. It's actually chasing the web. And um, the main reason why we do that is that we need to maintain the relative position of the web and the rewind roll. And uh, if we put the sensor on a fixed frame and look at this rewind roll, then we would not know the relative position between those two. Uh, that's the main reason why we attach the sensor onto the uh, moving rewind stand so that the sensor gives us indirectly the position of the rewind stand and the objective is to make sure that we move the rewind stand so that the middle of the sensor or the guide point of the sensor matches to the location of the web um, again like i mentioned it's not really guiding the web we are chasing the web so that the the uh, rewind roll would be at the right location to get the web 
uh, bound properly. So just to summarize about these two terminal guides, um, we can look at uh, what are the things that we need to have a good um, rewind or unwind guiding system. First of all, in terms of design, we need to make sure that the mechanical structure and rigidity and stiffness are designed properly. Uh, we are moving a big mass and um, depending upon the type of web, maybe metals, it may be thousands of pounds, uh, uh, multiple thousands of pounds that we are trying to move. And we need to make sure that the structure is rigid enough so that we can avoid any mechanical resonance. So the natural frequency of the structure should be at least three to four times the um, operating frequency of the control system. Uh, the other thing we need to consider, uh, especially with these kind of uh, guides, is that we need to size the actuator properly. Uh, when we talk about sizing the actuator, what we are talking about is it should have enough thrust so that it can push the mass, it has enough thrust to overcome the static friction, and it also has enough um, thrust to provide the desired acceleration to uh, reject the disturbances or errors that may be there. Um, just like the mechanical structure rigidity, we need to also make sure that the actuator coupling uh, and the actuator stiffness are all uh, accounted for. Uh, any play in the actuator coupling is going to reduce the stiffness of the overall system that's going to destabilize your system. In terms of installation consideration, the main thing that we want to look for in these type of guides is the location of the sensor with respect to the moving stand. Either it's fixed to the machine frame or it's it moving with the machine, uh, with the uh, uh, carriage. That's the main thing. Um, these web guides are simple. That's one of the advantages of these web guides. And uh, these web guides really do not... Um, uh, have to take advantage of the normal entry rule because all the rollers there are parallel to each other so there's not going to be any misalignment in them so there's going to be less amount of stresses on the web. Uh, the disadvantages with these kind of web guides well first of all you need a, a high thrust actuator especially when you have a larger mass to move and it's not cost effective uh, if you really want good performance from a web guide. Uh, if you want to uh, reject a high frequency disturbance, then this might not be a good choice for us. Now, moving over to intermediate web guides, uh, we have a displacement web guide. Um, uh, this is uh, another type of, uh, one of the most commonly used web guide that you're gonna see. And we would recommend this as the first choice for any web guiding application. Um, one of the main reasons for that is it actually displaces the web and um, uh, in this web guide um, it's uh, it's not bending the web. Uh, the reason why it's not bending the web is um, you have uh, this entry span and you have a 90 degree wrap and then you have the plane of the carriage right here. When this carriage pivots uh, the pivot point is shown here, but that's a mistake. It should have been right at the edge of right here. So when, when this carriage rotates, pivots uh, about the pivot point, which is at this point right there, um, these two rollers are actually moving in tandem. Uh, so there's no bending in this region. Um, and then in these pans, since they are perpendicular, that motion is a pure twist. So really, there is no bending uh, in this kind of a web guide. And um, if the web guide is designed properly, then um, these web guides can have one-to-one -one, uh, ratio in the sense that if you move the web guide one unit, then the web will actually move one unit. So that's why we, we call them as a perfect web guide. And I do see a question here that says that, would you agree that an offset pivot guide acts on a different principle other than normal entry? That is correct. Um, uh, just like I explained, because these two rollers are parallel to each other, there is no bending in the span. And since these two uh, entry and the exit rollers are perpendicular or the wrap angle 
uh, are perpendicular, this span is perpendicular to the plane of motion of the web guide, they are going to be in twist. So there's no bending, and when there's no bending, there's no normal entry coming into picture there. Um, so like I mentioned, um, the twist is an important design part, and um, and um, this would be our first choice for us uh, in terms of uh, applying it uh, in any um, web web guiding situation. So in terms of installation, um, again, we want to make sure that we have a 90 degree wrap at the entry and exit of the roller. And then there are some considerations on how, what is the span length at the entry and exit. So usually you can get away with uh, half a web width. Um, usually we recommend about one to two web widths if possible. And if you have a stiffer web like metals, like uh, you might need a much longer um, entry and exit span. Uh, we want to locate the sensor as close as possible. This is true for any web guide. It doesn't matter if it's a displacement guide, unwind guide, rewind guide, any web guide. We want to have the sensor as close as possible uh, in the span where the guiding action takes place. Um, and then in this case, the recommendation is to be within the first half of the uh, exit span. And then how long this span really depends upon how much correction you're looking for. Um, typically, these carriages are allowed to pivot only about 5 to 10 degrees. So if you want um, larger correction, then you can make these pants longer. Uh, the main thing is that you need to make sure that the plane of motion of the uh, uh, carriage is perpendicular to the entry and exit span so that you can create a pure twist on these spans. And then as long as these rollers are moving in tandem um, or parallel to each other, uh, then we will have the desired effect. Uh, they don't have to be on the same carriage. Uh, they can be on different carriages. As long as we are able to move, have them parallel to each other, uh, you can even have a process here. You don't really have to have just two rollers. You can have multiple rollers. So it, it provides a lot of flexibility here. And, um, and, and, and the guiding action is actually happening in the exit span. So what not to do? So we don't want to install the sensor too far away, um, or we don't want to install the sensor in the next span. Uh, this is mainly for control system purposes um, and stability. So when the web guide makes a corrective action, that action uh, is not seen at the sensor immediately. So if you're running really fast, you might get away with moving these sensors a little farther down. Uh, but if you're running slow, whenever this web guide moves here, uh, you would see that uh, motion if the sensor is as close to the um, um, down, uh, to the exit roller as possible. Um, if you install it here or here, especially when the web stops and, and there is a small error, the web guide would keep moving <clears throat> and that might cause the web to break or uh, have unintended consequences. So we don't really want to have the sensor farther away or in the next span. And we don't even we don't also want to have a, a scenario where you have a, an angle that is not 90 degrees. Um, so, as I mentioned, if you have a 90 degree uh, wrap, you have twist. As soon as you introduce something which is um, uh, deviating more from the 90 degree, you start creating bending in the web. So these kind of bending is going to act as um, understeering the web. Uh, it's going to cause bending that's going to understeer the web. Um, and it also causes uh, distortions and guide instability. So we don't really want to have any of these conditions. On the contrary, if you have a span, uh, exit span that is uh, spread out like this, uh, this is going to oversteer the web. Uh, again, it's the bending effect that is causing that. And we really don't want to do that. So ideal scenario would be to have a 90 degree wrap in and out. Uh, but there are other options uh, for um, <clears throat> wrapping the web there. Uh, you don't have to have it just like this, what 
like how we showed it's an inverted u configuration you can have the web go in like this or like this like a um, z configuration depending upon the space and all those things now obviously you can rotate all of these 90 degrees upside down just rotate all of them uh, so you would have about 16 different configurations that uh, you can do uh, with these web guides uh, all in all need to make sure that the entry and exit span are perpendicular to the plane of motion of the web guide and uh, all of these conditions satisfy that have the sensor as close to the web guide as possible we can satisfy that and then you can have multiple configurations for these so in summary the displacement guide the main design consideration uh, when when uh, somebody is asked to design a web guide uh, displacement guide is what is the desired correction uh, that that kind of determines our uh, span length uh, for the guide span other than that uh, in, in terms of installation it really depends upon how much space you have so you can design the entry and the exit span and then if you have a stiffer web you, you might have to exaggerate that entry and exit span make sure that we have 90 degree wrap and then uh, wrap the web guide based on the path so one of the other paths would be uh, in the same direction the web came in and things like that uh, advantages these are simple to install uh, the proper installation imports the least amount of stress on the web and then uh, it's pretty versatile uh, i put a disadvantage there but it's really not a disadvantage but i, I do want to have um, um i do want to have that uh, here it's like the the maximum correction that you can get is designed in so uh, in in, a, in another type of web guide where we can take advantage of steering um or or bending uh, we can get more than what the guide moves so um the second choice for us would be a steering guide and uh in 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 terms of how it works it's a little bit different you got a single roller and uh, this is the top view and this is kind of the side view and um, this roller is installed on two raceways they are at an angle so the web guide actually forms an arc like that so it moves and forms an arc back and forth um, uh, that's that's the um, that's how we are changing the axis of rotation and in this web guide we are creating a bending so there is a bending action here it's displacing as well as bending um, and then in terms of uh, the entry and the exit span, there are some guidelines for that as well, and we'll go through that. Um, this is not an ideal choice for us, uh, or this is not our first choice, because um, as I said, it's bending, so it's in introducing stress. If it's not installed properly, it can cause wrinkles, creasing, web tear, and edge uh, quality, uh, edge stresses, and things like that um so i just wanted to stop quickly and answer a couple of questions how do we determine the minimum entry and exit span uh, that really depends upon your stiffness of the web and things like that the average stress uh, there is a, a guidelines for that that i can share later on uh, but it really depends upon the tension the young's modulus of the web and then uh, the width of the web and then the span length so there is a formula where we can get the minimum uh, entry and exit span lengths and the entry and exit span need not be the same length they can have different lengths also how do you determine the correct length of the displace displacement guide table oh the guide table length is basically based on how much correction that you need uh, like i mentioned uh, usually the tables are made to uh, rotate about 5 to 15 degrees so um, so the displacement that you need would be let's say L is the length of the span on the guide table uh, and theta would be the angle of displacement the correction would be L sine theta theta so that is the maximum correction you can get so based on what maximum correction you need uh, you can uh, get the length of the uh, uh, the guides uh, uh, yeah the guide span on a displacement guide uh, 
and theta is the upper limit we can say 15 degrees so okay uh switching back to the steering guide in terms of installation what do we need to look for well <clears throat> we need to make sure that the exit span is perpendicular to the plane of motion of the web guide so uh, again the main thing that we are trying to do with this is to make sure that the exit span is in pure twist um, this is where the uh, 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 this allows us to have the least amount of stress in the web so we want to do that now the entry and the exit span uh, um, length of that is also depending upon the stiffness of the web you typically need a longer entry span uh, for a rewind guide because the, uh, the, dis the the motion of the web guide or the displacement of the web happens because of bending. Um, so you have to follow um, uh, those guidelines in terms of if you have a stiffer web, you need to have a longer span so that you can allow the bending to happen. But normally it's about one to five times the width of the web. And then the exit span can be half a web width. Uh, and there's also minimum uh, formula for finding out the minimum um, span length there. Um, in terms of uh, other things here, uh, let me go back here and talk a little bit about the instant sender. Like I mentioned, there's a raceway, uh, two raceways here, and they are angled so that you can have the web guide uh, go around an arc. And the center of the arc is called the instant sender this is important we need to make sure that the instant center is within the span and it's at a certain distance about half the length of the span or up to two-thirds the length of the span again these are all numbers coming from the dynamic model of the web guide and the 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 dynamics of the uh, uh, web itself and if you don't follow those conditions, then you can have a web guide oversteering, understeering, creating a, a, an awful lot of stresses, maybe wrinkles, slack edges, tight edges, and all those kind of things. So, but uh, the main things that we want to look for is this angle. Uh, make sure that it's 90 degrees, and then you have an entry span that is pretty long. You can have different wrap here. Um, we don't want to go more than 45 degrees on either side. Uh, that is fine. Uh, when you do that, what you're doing is you're adding uh, twisting, uh, per se. So whenever it goes away from this uh, 90 degrees, it's not pure bending. There is bending and twisting that is involved there. And then we want to have uh, an angle here because, again, when you put bending stresses here, you have the possibility of that uh what we call as moment transfer occur here so the motion of this roller can actually move the web uh, upstream of the uh, guide roller so in order to avoid that we want to have certain conditions here and then we also want this span shorter so that it becomes harder for that moment transfer to occur so those are some of the uh, guidelines for installation of a steering guide and again sensor as close as possible now what not to do same thing we don't want to put the sensor too far away um, one of the things that is not really evident is that we don't want to put the plane of motion of the web guide at anything other than 90 degrees it's not this angle between the entry and the exit span that needs to be 90 degrees it's actually the angle of the plane of motion of the web guide and the exit roller that's what determines whether you're going to have a twisting action that's going to happen here or not so when you when you have something like that you're going to introduce bending in the span and when you start bending a short span uh, it's not a good sign so we don't really want to do that so that's the main reason why we need to have the plane of motion perpendicular not really the entry and the exit span but the plane of motion and then like i mentioned if you have the entry span and the pre-entry span longer than the entry span then you could have moment transfer happening uh, that's something that you don't want to do either <clears throat> in terms of wrap angles uh pretty simple you can have something going up like that or going down like that as long as we follow this condition that exit span is perpendicular to the plane of motion then we are in good shape 
just to summarize the design consideration, um, um, design correction is one of the main things there. Uh, and the raceways that we have on the steering guides, we don't want to angle them more than 25 degrees. Um, so anywhere between Z, um, like 5 to 20 degrees would be the ideal one. In, in terms of installation, um, steering guide is a lot more complicated to install. Uh, you have to consider the stiffness of the web. That determines the entry span length. Um, and then you also need to make sure that you're not putting too much uh, bending stress on the web based on how stiff your web is. And then uh, the location of the instant center, uh, which depends upon the raceway angles. Uh, again, that depends upon the length of the entry span. So there are lots of things going on here that uh, we need to consider for proper installation of a steering guide. And uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, these web guides are prone to have a lot of issues because they're not properly installed. In terms of advantages, they're, they're simple. So they're cost effective. It's just a single roller. Um, so it's 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 inexpensive, but it comes with other things that uh, increase the overall cost of ownership. Um, it's hard to install. A lot of attention to detail is required, and a lot of these have, um, especially because of the bending and things like that, uh, loss of traction or anything like a moment transfer occurring, can actually amplify the error. Uh, so a poorly installed or poorly um, uh, design steering guide can actually uh, produce error, more, amplify the error than uh, um, than what it's intended to do. Uh, there are a few other types of web guides uh, that are not used uh, commonly, but um, they are center pivoted guide. Again, they are going to use the uh, uh, normal entry rule to try to um, um, steer or guide the web um, so there's bending that's going to happen so we're going to have similar considerations in terms of entry span pre-entry span and exiting span um, because they don't have any displacement uh, like in a steering guide you displace and change the angle of rotation uh, in these guides it's only the angle of rotation they are usually really slow in terms of response and they're not an ideal choice uh, in, in modern uh, guiding principles. But uh, the same design considerations have to be followed with, as in a steering guide. Um, so that kind of gives us a quick summary about different web guides and uh, how to install them and things like that. So the next uh, part of uh, web guiding is the actuators. So uh, in terms of actuators, there are lots of terminology that is involved. Um, some of them are thrust or power, how fast the accelerator is, what is the correction speed, what is the acceleration, stroke length, uh, mounting, uh, what type of coupling that we have, and things like that. Um, actuators are pretty common or pretty uh, standard right now. Uh, it's not as important as installation of a web guide or the sensor. Uh, but it is an important part of a web guiding system. Uh, the, the older actuators were either pneumatic or hydraulic. Uh, you had a hydraulic pump pumping a, a double acting cylinder and moving the, um, uh, the web guide structure. Uh, these were more common in the 50s and up to about maybe 90s uh, before the electronic, uh, uh, electromechanical actuators started uh, coming into the market. So you could have pneumatic actuators or hydraulic actuators. The hydraulic actuators have the advantage that it can provide pretty high thrust and can shift uh, large loads pretty quickly. Even now in metals industry, uh, hydraulic actuators are pretty common. You can see them. Uh, but the problems are that it's a problem with maintenance. You need to balance the valves and stuff like that, uh, change the filters. They could cause leak, and this could contaminate your product. And then the precision and accuracy that you can get with an electronic actuator or electric actuator is not something that you can expect in a hydraulic actuator. Uh, so most uh, web guides nowadays are going to use um, electromechanical actuators, like what I have shown here. Uh, these actuators usually have a motor uh, that drives a belt 
pulley kind of a system and there's usually a lead screw a ball screw or a roller screw that um, converts the rotary motion into linear motion at the end of the actuator um, so some some common terminologies that you would see with actuators are uh, what is the maximum current voltage power uh, whenever we have something with a lead screw or a pitch, then that's a common term that you're going to see. What is the lead of the actuator, pitch of the actuator, gearing ratio. Uh, backlash is another thing that you would commonly see with electric actuators, uh, especially with low-end uh, lead screw actuators. And resolution, again, what is the smallest movement that an actuator can produce? Uh, that's another term. Uh, back drive is some uh, a common terminology that you would see, especially if you're installing a web guide uh, that uh, has to work against gravity. Um, and then types of actuators, you have inline and reverse parallel. Some actuators have limit switches or end stops. And then uh, type of motor used in the actuator, you would commonly see servo stepper, brushed or brushless DC motor. So actuators are providing the driving force uh, to the guide structure uh, so that it can position the web. Um, in terms of uh, thrust, uh, the thrust is the amount of force that is exerted by the actuator to move the guide structure. And uh, this thrust really depends upon, uh, as we saw before, mass of the structure that we are trying to move, what is the friction there, how fast you want to move, and sometimes uh, gravity as well, uh, if you're acting against gravity. Uh, in terms of sizing actuators, uh, these are some of the things that we would need to know uh, to size an actuator properly. Uh, web line speed, uh, mainly because uh, if you have a slow moving web, uh, the 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 uh, the maximum disturbance frequency that you can get really depends upon the speed of uh, transport of the web. So if you're just moving at 100 feet per minute, you might not need a high dynamic response. While if you're moving at really high speed, you might need a much higher dynamic response. That's the main reason why we need that. And then the the dynamic response is related to the acceleration. Acceleration is related to to the thrust. So that's why line speed becomes important. Um, guide structure weight and roll weight. Again, if you're trying to move a big mass, we need to know that. What type of bearing you're using so that uh, what is the breakaway force that we need to overcome based on uh, the coefficient of friction of the bearing. Uh, and then what kind of disturbances we are trying to correct for. Um, again, like I said, there is a correlation between uh, the amount of disturbance that can propagate uh, through a roll-to-roll -roll machine um, that really depends upon uh, the speed of the web. Uh, the faster you go, higher frequency disturbances can go through. So the web acts as like a low-pass filter. And then the acceleration. Uh, and then if you have to look at any uh, <clears throat> gravitational effects. So these are some of the key factors that are involved in properly sizing an actuator. But like I said, actuators are pretty straightforward nowadays. Uh, just need to have some basic questions answered and then we'll be good to go. Uh, one of the most important parts of a uh, web guiding system is the sensor. Uh, it is important because what you can't measure, you can't control. So if you have a poor sensor and you're not able to measure the position properly, then there's no way that we can get the accuracy that we need. Uh, in terms of uh, sensor terminologies, range, resolution, accuracy, linearity, those are some things that you would see. Type of sensors, infrared, optical, ultrasonic, air, uh, type of uh, uh, things that you're trying to look for in terms of web position. Are you trying to look at edge of a web? Are you trying to look for a line on the web or a contrasting feature on the web? How much, how fast can the sensor measure? Um, and then, um, Pass line and plane change. These are not important nowadays, but older ultrasonic sensors uh, have issues with uh, pass line changes. So you can't have the web too close to the ultrasonic emitter because it might reflect the sound waves uh, 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 in a way that uh, doesn't provide an accurate measurement. And then temperature drift. Again, ultrasonic sensors can have issues with temperature drift uh, when we have uh, 
um, the, the piezoelectric crystal frequency changes, and then what kind of a signal output that you get from the sensor. Uh, that's some of the terminologies. So essentially, range of a sensor is what is the maximum lateral displacement that the sensor can measure. Uh, most often, for web guiding applications, range is not that important just because of the fact that you're controlling, you're going to bring it in. Uh, but it does become uh, uh, critical when you have web width changes and things like that. So uh, most often, uh, range is like how much change in the lateral uh, position that you can measure with the sensor. Uh, resolution is the minimum lateral position change that the sensor can see. So if you want to guide a web to 5 thousandths of an uh, inch, uh, then you better have a, res a sensor that can have 4x or 2x higher resolution than uh, the guiding accuracy. Uh, um, accuracy is basically an indication of how close the sensor measurement is to the real measurement. Uh, this becomes important for certain types of sensors that are affected by materials, material properties like opacity, porosity, and things like that. Uh, so this is an important characteristic of a sensor. And then uh, linearity is like, um, uh, what, uh, how consistent is your measurement uh, with respect to the uh, actual position across the entire range of the sensor. That's what linearity means. So in terms of sensing, why is it important? Uh, like I mentioned, some sensors have issues with uh, material properties like opacity, porosity, or reflectivity, or they may be affected by environmental issues such as airflow, uh, temperature changes, or vacuum, and things like that. So uh, uh, if we can't measure, we can't control. So that's why sensing is an important part of uh, having a good uh, guiding performance. Uh, most often you would see uh, uh, these type of sensors, uh, we refer to as opposing beam or fork style or horseshoe style. There are lots of different names for it. Uh, basically how this works is you have uh, one arm emitting a certain type of signal and the other arm receiving that signal and then the web that goes in between it blocks it. It's a pretty simple technology uh, work sensing principle and it works well for a lot of different cases. Uh, the problem happens whenever uh, depending upon this type of sensor signal that you have, if the web allows that signal to leak through um, when, it, when, it's, when it's blocked by the uh, web. Uh, that's where the problem occurs. So we talked about linearity, resolution, range. All of those things are affected by this kind of sensor uh, whenever that uh, change occurs. Uh, this sensing signal can be air. It could be uh, optical, like visible light or infrared light or even UV light. And then it could also be sound, like ultrasonic. Uh, it really doesn't matter. And then um, whether this material is opaque or porous to that signal is what it matters uh, in terms of how well you can guide. And often manufacturers recommend different sensors for different materials and different conditions. So you will have a plethora of uh, sensing technologies out there. Like I said, the main disadvantage is, is material dependent, gain change occurs, and then requires calibration if you want to get a really good guiding performance. Uh, there are other sensor technologies out there, uh, like ours, which are not affected by material properties and some of the environmental conditions. I'm not going to go into detail about our sensor technology here, but just going to give you a quick overview. Um, it's basically a high accuracy uh, direct measurement or absolute measurement. And then um, our resolution does not depend upon the range and it can work with any material. Uh, I'll give you some resources at the end of the presentation so that you can uh, take a look at our stuff. Um, so that's uh, the sensor. So finally, the final component of uh, the web guiding system is the controller. So the controller is basically the central processor that takes the sensor input 
and then computes what the corrective action needs to be and then it sends that information to the actuator um, uh, nowadays uh, the controllers also include a human machine interface like an operator interface uh, but um, um, previously the controller could be standalone um, it doesn't really didn't really have an interface and even the controller could be analog in the sense of electrical analog or pneumatic analog controllers um, so basically controller is taking the sensor signal and then um, making the necessary computation uh, so that uh, the actuator can be positioned at the desired location in terms of terminology, uh, gain is one of the most common things that you're going to hear uh, in controllers. Um, that's basically saying how quickly or what kind of a dynamic response that you need. Uh, that's basically the gain is going to do that. Other things that you're going to see is operating voltage, power consumption, whether you have a operator interface or not, and then uh, whether this is a controller for a servo motor or stepper motor or whatever that is they have drives or drivers for it how many sensor inputs you have uh, does it have ethernet connectivity does it have remote control and stuff like that in terms of the control structure um, most control systems have um, web guide control systems have this kind of a structure where you have a fixed gain proportional control uh, you really don't need anything more than a proportional control for a web guide uh, because there is integrator built into it. Uh, but usually you have something like you have a motor, it might have a current loop, it might also have a velocity loop with a tachometer or something like that. And then you have a guide structure which has its own um, transmission ratio. And there's the web dynamics, which is unknown. Uh, web dynamics means that if you move the guide one mm, how much is the web going to move? That really depends upon uh, transport conditions, the stiffness of the web, tension, and all those kind of things. And then finally, you have a sensor that measures the edge position, and then it sends that uh, to a position controller that's going to drive all of these loops. So this is a pretty simple uh, architecture for most web guide controllers. Uh, they are fixed gain and most often they are detuned uh, because of the stability and all the other reasons. Most web guides, their controller is kind of detuned um, for the conditions. Um, if you want to get the best out of it, you would need to retune them. And uh, the tuning has to be based on the optimal performance because the web dynamics is unknown. Um, um, most often DC motors or DC servo motors or stepper motors are used in this kind of a control structure. Uh, it's pretty common. Uh, there are some other advanced control technologies uh, which are like adaptive control where um, the controller can adapt or learn on the fly and tuning may not be required. When we say learning on the fly, it means that maybe it adapts to sensor gain changes, or the sensor, um, uh, the dynamics of the web and all those kind of things, it's possible that we can have a controller that can adapt. Um, in our case, we have a, a pretty similar structure as the one I showed in the first one. Uh, it's still a fixed gain controller, but uh, with, um, with uh, some uh, motion control aspects built into it in terms of uh, S curving the position and having trajectories for velocity, uh, we can increase the stability of the controller and provide a pretty aggressive output performance. Um, again, uh, pretty similar. You can have a current loop, a position loop, uh, if you have an encoder, and then uh, position of the actuator uh, here, and then the, finally the, uh, the web position, uh, which includes the web dynamics. Um, just to give you an idea, um, we have a lot of different uh, uh, things that we can do uh, with the controller, but um, uh, the dynamics is basically if you move the, uh, this is showing a step response, open loop step response um, for a web. This was like a non-woven web that we had at different speeds. And um, 
uh, see how it behaves. And you can see that when you have a step, it, I mean, uh, even though it's open loop, it's trying to get there. Um, and, and, and the dynamics, open loop dynamics is uh, different based on how fast you're running. So faster you're running, it gets to that desired location uh, as fast as possible. But the slower you're running, it takes longer to get to that desired location. Again, this is an open loop response. This is the, the, the final part of the whole web guiding thing, which is the dynamics of the web. Now, if we ha add a controller to it, and this was our controller, um, then we can have a much better response and we can actually push the web guide. Um, in this case, um, at the two different speeds that we were running at, uh, this was the reference change and uh, this was the actual response of the web guide at the sensor. And then when we have another sensor installed, one span downstream, you can see how long it takes for that to go through. Um, again, uh, when we have a step response, you can, we were able to get up to about 170 millimeters per second or like seven inches per second. Um, this is about close to 70% improvement over an open loop response. And again, this is closed loop. That means you are actually actively guiding the web. Um, so with a proper control structure design, you can get like a high bandwidth system close to six hertz or something like that and then um, uh, even get a well damped system. So you can actually have an aggressive correction if you need to. Um, in terms of the characteristics of a good web guiding system um, is that uh, it should have uh, the ability to uh, attenuate disturbances, easy to tune, obviously it needs to be stable, has good processing power, um, so that it can process multiple sensors, have uh, industrial ethernet connectivity. These are for advanced functionalities. Um, and then the smarts and intelligence for industry 4.0. So the final question uh, here is that, uh, well, you have a web guide and we talked about all these different things. Uh, what is the accuracy or how, uh, how accurately can you guide a web? Um, it actually depends. Um, like I mentioned, there are lots of different parameters there uh, that are going to affect the accuracy of uh, 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 the web guide. At the, uh, if you are just dealing with a steady state error, uh, we can expect plus or minus 0 0.25 millimeters. Uh, if you have a good machine and a perfect material, this is what you can expect. And um, uh, higher uh, accuracies are possible, like in printed electronics and stuff like that. Uh, you can get uh, much higher accuracy. Um, but again, we're, if we're dealing with steady state errors, you have a good edge and all those kind of things, uh, this is possible. But the problem is that most web guides are going to come into transient errors. These are either disturbances or materials or uh, material properties that are going to affect um, the uh, the disturbance at the web guide. Now, if you're trying to correct a transient error, it really depends upon what is the magnitude of the error, what is the frequency of the error, um, and so on and so forth. And another important thing that we need to uh, consider is that these transient errors can actually propagate downstream of the sensor. And uh, these are called what are called as weave generation. Uh, even though you correct it at the sensor, um, you don't really know the angle at which the web is approaching. And that can cause what is called as weaves downstream. Um, again, if you, you won't have good guiding performance if you have wrinkles. I mean, if the web is wrinkling, uh, that is going to cause the edge to move back and forth. And there's no way that you can have good guiding performance with that or edge curl or flutter or sometimes plane change can also have that effect. Um, if you have large magnitude error and your stroke of the actuator is limited, or the correction that the web guide can provide is limited, then you can expect good guiding performance whenever the actuator tops out on either side of its stroke. Um, again, if you use a lower bandwidth actuator and you have a higher frequency error, you can expect good guiding performances. And uh, sensor, if you don't have a good sensor 
or if it has gain changes, then you can expect a good guiding performance. And then um, improper installation can actually amplify the error. So that's another thing that uh, we can expect. Anyway, so just to summarize the factors affecting, we talked about a machine related, process related, material related, and the web guide related, which is like uh, the stroke, dead band, actuator backlash, correction, stroke limit, and things like that. So in terms of uh, design requirement, uh, a good knowledge of uh, the, uh, the, the conditions like web speed, location, thickness, stiffness, environment, tension, uh, desired correction, all of these are important for us to have a good, uh, well-designed web guide. And then um, obviously if you have a good understanding of all of these, we will do well. Uh, I know we're running out of time. This is my last slide. And I just wanted to bring this up to summarize it. Um, just to summarize our fundamentals of web guiding. Well, webs, machines, process, nothing is going to be perfect. So we do mostly we need web guides to co correct for it. Uh, most of the web guiding um, or the, the traction or the steering of the web happens because of the normal entry rule. So whenever you have a misaligned roller or an out of round roller, all of those things are going to affect uh, uh, the, the, the disturbance created within the machine. Uh, the sensors, when you're installing it on a web guide, we need to be installed as close as possible to the web guide. And then the web guide has to be located as close to the process that needs alignment. Uh, we cannot have an unwind and have a guide on the unwind and then have 10 spans later, you have a process where you need the, where you need the alignment. Uh, we need to have the web guide right next to the process where the alignment is needed. Uh, none of these action of the web guide uh, will have any effect if we don't have traction. Uh, traction is indirectly related to tension. So if you don't have good tension or traction between the web and the roller, uh, you cannot expect good guiding performance. Um, proper installation, uh, depending upon the type of web guide uh, we have, uh, is important. And then also, Improper installation can actually adversely affect your material. It may wrinkle the material, create edge stresses or instability. And finally, the overall guiding performance, it's actually a function of the sensor, the actuator, the controller, even the web itself. So uh, in order to have all of those, we need to have a pretty good, um, all of these have to be pretty good. Um, that's the summary, and um, I do have a slide which shows some additional informations on um, uh, different um, uh, things that we have on our website. I will leave this for a quick second, and I was supposed to have some polls that I was supposed to share with you, but I didn't. So I'm going to have uh, some of these uh, put up right now. And uh, if you can answer these questions, that would be great. Um, basically, we want to make sure that uh, uh, this webinar, whether it was useful to you or not, and um, also know um, what would be something that you would be interested in in the future. Uh, And what are some of the biggest problems that you see in your operation? Is it uh, web guiding? Is it tension related? Is it raw material related? Uh, or process quality issues? Okay, so while I have these polls on, uh, let's see if I have anything that I have missed in the Q&A. Okay, so there was a question about why would you want a deliberately oscillated role? Well, uh, there are some times where um, you have gauge band variation. That means the thickness of the web across the width of the web is different. Uh, this is especially true when you are folding the web or like in shrink sleeve applications. 
And if you guide the web at the same location, um, um, the gauge band variation is going to have different uh, stresses on the wound roll. Um, so the hardness of the roll along the width of the web would be different. Um, and, and that causes problems uh, in terms of telescoping and uh, when you transport the rolls and things like that, it might have some issues. So what they do is they deliberately move the web guide back and forth um, so that the, uh, uh, the thickness variation is evenly spread across the entire width of the roll. So that's why you want to deliberately oscillate the roll back and forth. Uh, these are only when when your converting process um, has an intended uh, thickness difference, like when you are sealing uh, or cl closing and sealing a web guide. Um, there's a question about uh, master slave application. Uh, what is that? And could you give an example? OK, so whenever you have a, a lamination process, uh, you have uh, one layer of the web that you need to laminate with respect to another layer of the web. Uh, that's when it would be important to have a master slave. So one layer of the web can be guided to a location. And then the other uh, layer of the web, it's a reference or the guide point would be dynamically adjusted so that you can match those two webs together. It can also be done if both these web guides are um, uh, guided to the same uh, machine reference. Uh, but usually that's a problem because when you're moving the sensor, you don't know if you put them exactly at the same machine reference. So in that case, you would have one web as a master and then the slave uh, web guide will have its guide point uh, changed based on the um, based on the master position. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, got another poll here. Uh, what are your biggest challenges with web guides? Uh, is it the lack of performance? Is the complexity of setting them up uh, or doesn't have enough features? Uh, what is the biggest challenge for that for you? And finally, um, in terms of future topics, what would be of interest in the future webinars? Um, we talked about fundamentals of web guiding here. Um, we didn't talk about anything related to um, web guiding applications like edge guiding, center guiding, line guiding, contrast guiding, those things we didn't talk about. Uh, there are advanced web guiding concepts as well. Are you interested in measurement and sensing technology or general web handling topics? And would you be interested in uh, training uh, on roll to roll products? Okay, so there is a question from Jay, and let's see if I can allow Jay to talk. Oops, that went away. Okay, there we go. Okay, Jay, I think your microphone should be enabled. Jay, did you have a question? Okay. Um, well, um, hopefully, um, we were able to give you a little bit about uh, the fundamentals of web guiding. And uh, let's see if, if we can uh, show some of the results here. Oh. Anyway, um, thank you so much for your time uh, this afternoon. And um, thank you for um, 
giving us an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about web guiding and web guiding fundamentals. Uh, I have put our contact information there. If you have any other further questions, uh, please let us know either by email or calling us. And then uh, we have this webinar recorded. And uh, what we could do is uh, we will share uh, the video of the webinar uh, in a follow up email. And uh, if nobody else has any other questions, um, we would we'll, uh, we'll stop the session and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.